I've gotten lost twice back there. I finally found my way out. Well, Devotions of the Dead, uh, today we're going to be doing something called Ashes to Ashes. So what is this all about? So let me help you real quick. We're going to be taking people who died in the Bible, why they died, and what does that mean to us? What was God trying to tell us? Next week we're going to do Black Widow, by the way. So you de definitely need to be here for that one. But ashes to ashes today, go ahead and get your outline out, get your Bibles out, get your iPads out, whatever you got to get to follow along. We're going to give you some stuff today because what happens to most of us when we read the Bible, hopefully all of you are reading it, uh, we kind of read over things. We get a couple of verses and it says a couple of things and we just kind of move on. But it's a real big deal. Some of those things that we miss is a real big deal to God and we're going to talk about that as we open this up. So the idea today would be, you know, we can disobey God or we can be disobedient to God and we get to live. That wasn't all the, always the case and that was in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about some people who disobeyed God and they died and why. It's a good thing that we live now. Just want you to know because most of us would not be in this room. Okay? So it's a good thing we live now. And so I want you to get that as we walk into this. This week something happened for us. And for me, my daughter, who's nine years old, her name is Faith, of course, if all of you are new, she came to me, she says, Daddy, I want to play golf. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, this is only God doing this, you know, kind of thing. So he, I want to play golf. And I said, well, why do you want to play golf? I had some clubs. I mean, I had this thing ready to go. I had the clubs sitting at the door. You know, I had the little funny animals on top to, to appeal to a daughter, kind of thing. I said, why do you want to do that? She said, well... I heard that you can get scholarships in college for golf. And there's all these girl scholarships, this is the honest truth, just laying around and nobody's using them. She said, so I want to get a scholarship to play golf. I said, well, that's really good. And she said, I know I can get other stuff, but I think I want to play golf. I said, okay. So we, we chipped around the front yard, so I'm going to take her out to the driving range. And so I started to do that. She said, well, Daddy, you know, I got to get a glove. And I said, oh, this is kind of where it's going. So she got her pink hat. It says John Deere on it, okay? She got her glove, but the glove, see, I, I buy gloves for guys, for me. You know, I don't care what color it is, as long as it fits. That's not the way it works. It's got to be a certain color. So we went out, we went to Walmart. We actually found one that had a little pink on it that matched the hat, so she was good for that. She had her little sunglasses on. She said, I'm ready. I'm ready to go play golf now. I said, well, that's good. She said, now next, we'll need to talk about the outfit. I went, I said, wait a minute now, is this about the outfit? You know, are we going to play golf, that kind of thing. Well, anyway, we get out there, and I was praying, hoping to God at least she had some kind of swing. Okay, nine years old. And so she does have a swing, okay? So the idea, she said, Daddy, what do I do? And I showed her, showed her how to hold her hands. You know, we got this little grip thing. So we got all this out there. She said, Daddy, what do I do? I said, what I want you to do is just hit the ball. Just try to hit the ball. That's all we're going to do. So she was swinging around. You know, that's a big deal. Try to, I mean, if you ever try to hit a golf ball and you've never done that, that thing, it's all over the place. So here we are. She starts hitting, I st and I teed them up on my knees. I'm a good daddy, okay? Teeing them up. And I finally, so she started hitting one after another. And so she hit it over 40 yards by the time we got there. Like this. She said, what else do I need to know? And I said, hold on a minute. You know, she said, what about my back? So I said, hold on a minute. You don't need to know anything else. You need to know, just hit the ball. Make contact with the ball. That's all we need to know right now. She was wanting to know about putting. She wanted to know about chipping. I said, no, no, hit the ball. That's all you need to know. And so it actually worked. Okay. Now we're going to work on swing and we're going to work on putting, but she's not ready for all that. She just needs to do what she knows right now, and that's hit the ball. And when we look at the Scripture, and you'll see this over and over again. I thought about this, that we're always wanting something more from God, but yet we're not willing to do what we already know. And you think you're going to get more truth from God, and you're not going to do the truth you already know. Let me help you. You're not going to get any more truth. You need to learn to hit the ball. You need to quit asking God, well, show me how to putt and show me how to swing. You don't hit. The first thing you need to learn is hit the ball. What has he told you already to do? Look at the, I have this on your outline. God will never reveal more truth about himself until you obey what you already know. That is a true statement. Because we're always wanting more information. And here's one of the things, you know, we're going to talk about this. When we look at what God wants from us, 
And here's what he doesn't like. He doesn't like the thought of it or the prayer of it or the talk of it. He likes the doing of it. And that's the difference between walking with God and becoming like Jesus Christ is the actual doing of what you know rather than the learning of it, the thinking of it, and the talking of it. He's actually looking for people who's going to actually do what they know. And once you do what you know now, you will get more later. It's just like the golf swing. Once faith is able to do one thing, hit the ball, then we'll do something else. But many of you, before you move, you want to know what's on the other side. You want to know about it before you read it. You want to reach out for it before you see it. You see, that's not going to happen. You need to do, and this is one of the things we're going to talk about today, we need to do what we know. That's what he's looking for. And so, whether it be sin, whether it be disobedience, or whatever it is, what is God really looking for? And how is it that we can disobey God now and we live? In the Old Testament, it didn't work out so well. It didn't work out well at all. So many of you in this room, we're not going to have to be obedient to death, okay? This is a thought for you. We're not going to die for our faith. It's not going to happen in this room. And what I would say to you, it's probably harder to live for God than to die for Him. I think that would probably be harder. And you'll see this as we go in the Scripture. He's asking us to be obedient to certain things. He's asked certain things from us. But yet we as Christians get to decide, we pick and choose what we like. And we wonder what's wrong. We wonder why things aren't happening, why God's not answering my prayer. Is God even hearing me? We're going to find out as we walk through this. So in the Old Testament, and you don't have to pardon my nose, that golden rod is killing me. As we walk through the Old Testament, you will find if people disobeyed, people died. Okay? Especially when you're dealing with Him. If God says, this is what I want you to do, and you didn't do it, you died. That's what happened in the Old Testament. And there had to be some place where the people's sins could be atoned for. So we look at some of these things that we walk through. We look at some of the people who died. We look at the, the, I call them preacher kids. I'll get to them in a minute. Preacher kids are always the meanest kids, usually. Okay, y'all know that. And uh, they won't pay attention. They won't do what they're supposed to do. And so the same thing was in the Old Testament. It's amazing. In the Old Testament, same thing happened. Preacher kids mean, but in the Old Testament, they didn't get a whipping, they got killed, okay? So you could lose part of your family in one day. And it happened all the time, especially with the priest back in those days. So many of us will never die for our faith. But I want to share a story with you as a martyr. And we talk about martyrs, people dying for their faith. I'm going to read something to you. And it's in England in 1555, true story. A man wanted to know if God was real. A man wanted to know if the grace of God still held true because his friend Thomas was about to be burned alive for his faith in England in 1555. So we have this conversation right before he dies, and his friend says, Thomas, he lowered his voice so he wouldn't be heard by the guard. Thomas, I have to ask you a favor. I need to know if what Others say about the grace of God is true. I need to know. Tomorrow when they burn you at the stake, if the pain is tolerable and your mind is still at peace with your hands above your head, do it right before you die. He wanted to know if God's word was true and the grace of God was true. Thomas, I have to know. Thomas whispered to his friend, I will the next morning. Thomas was bound at the stake, and the fire was lit. The fire burned a long time, but Thomas remained motionless. His skin was burned to a crisp, and his fingers were burned off. If you can see the sight. Everyone was watching was supposed that Thomas was already dead. Suddenly, Thomas lifted his hands, nubs, still on fire over his head, reached up toward heaven, He reached out toward the living God, is what they said, clapping his nubs together three times, and then he died, letting all his friends know that God's grace and God's love is true. We will never, ever experience that. I I can't imagine that ever happening here. You know, I say, well, I'll be obedient to death. 
and I'll die for my faith. I don't, I don't know. I think what God's after, though, and where we live now and what we're doing, it would be better for you if you would actually live it. Because that's actually going to move the kingdom more. We know that in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, that the disciples, the best thing for them to do was to actually die. Because the death births a movement, and that's what happens. But now we're looking at a different, different deal. It's hard for us to obey and to do what we're supposed to do. And I'm not talking, when I say the word obey, I'm not saying just do what you're supposed to do so you can be a good person. This is a different kind of obedience that I'm talking about, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. Why is it that we can live and disobey God when the others could not? That's the question that's going to be answered as we walk through this. Isaiah 5.21, it says this, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. The preacher kids in these stories thought they, had it, they knew what they were doing. And all of us have our own thoughts, don't we? We have our own ideas about how we ought to do things. We have our own ideas how Christianity is supposed to affect our life. And a lot of times we, just, we like some things of the Christianity and we like that part. And I'll tell you what that is in a minute. And the other stuff we don't like so we just don't do it. And we think we can get away with that. And we can, be, we can say, well, I'll pick and choose God's Word, and God will be okay with that. He's not okay with that. You just don't know how it's affecting your life, and we're going to get there in just a minute. So we got some preacher kids. Let me give you one. Um, this is the one in, in 1 Samuel. You won't have to turn there yet. I'm going to give you the other one in just a minute. 1 Samuel, Eli had a couple of sons, and they were basically stealing, basically stealing the the sacrifices and the stuff that people were bringing. And so they were bringing them, and here's what happened. He was very old, Eli. I heard about everything his sons were doing. So all of Israel, they slept with the women who served at the entrance of the tent meeting, stealing portions of the offerings to God. Those preacher kids. Now here's, here's what I think you need to know first before we get there. In the old days, God met in a tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. You remember this. You hear us talking about it. You can go on the Internet and look it up. And so God's presence was actually with them on the earth in a place in the Holy of Holies. That's where they were. And the priest's kids were designed and made, basically, Levi, the tribe of Levites to actually take care of this and to serve and take care of the, the offerings and everything that was going to be brought to that. So they are dealing with the living God right here. Through the curtain, into the Holy of Holies, his presence was there. And you'll know, you'll know why in just a minute what was going on. And they decided they were going to mess with that. They were going to steal the things that were going to be the burnt offering. This was the offering that was going to be here that was going to be burnt for the atonement for the people's sin. And they were stealing it. And they were sleeping with the girls that were bringing it. You cannot mess with him. You cannot treat God like another person, and yet sometimes we do. So he asked, he said, why are you doing these things? He said, what are you doing there? I heard from the people about these wicked things. No, my sons, it's not good report I hear from spreading of, God, of the Lord's people. It's not good what you're doing. If a man sins, sins against another man, God can mediate before him and between them. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede? If you sin against God, we're dealing in Old Testament, who's going to stand before, for you? Nobody. No one. They did not listen, and they both died that day. You just don't mess with God. If he says certain things, that's what he's looking for. So how is it that we can live and disobey? And the Old Testament did not work out so well. You cannot treat God like another person. That's what you have to understand. And sometimes we do. It's okay to tell this, it's okay to do that. And even though it's a sin, I ought to be okay as if it's all right, as if God's not looking. And yet we do it anyway. So we'll talk about that. But you think about, as a Christian, we like to keep the things that are a benefit to us. We like that stuff. When it comes to answering our prayers, you know, and the comfort and the peace and the joy and those kind of things, we like that. God meeting our needs. Kelly just read the verse, Philippians 4.19, just read the verse. We like it. But then all of a sudden, we like that part, but then all of a sudden God says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I don't like that. Pray for your enemies. Well, I don't like that. Put others' needs before your own. We don't like that. 
bring God's tithe and offerings to the storehouse and you keep his money, what happened? What happened? We don't like that. And then you ask this question, why isn't God blessing my life? Why aren't things happening? Why aren't my prayers being answered? I'll give you a clue real quick. God doesn't deal with sin. Ever. You, you will never have sin in your life and participate in sin and hear from God. It's not going to happen. You're, you're going to have to deal with it and the practice of it. And we'll talk about that. So we know that God's gonna, not going to do that. Obedience to God, I want you to think about this. Obedience to God is the practice of His ways. And why should we be obedient to God? Is it to make Him happy? Is it to make us feel better about ourselves? Is it that we can, you know, we'll be good Christians if we're obedient to God? God has another plan because of obedience. You will never become like Jesus Christ without obedience. I'll show you how this works in just a minute. But in the Old Testament, you disobey God, you die. But not today, right? Not today. We don't have to do that. It's not the thought of it. It's not the prayer of it or the talk of it. But it's the doing of it. If I'm going to be obedient to God, then I'm going to actually do what He told me to do. It's going to be acted out in my life, and you'll see this as it happens. As we get to the ashes to ashes, we have two more sons that are really going to be stupid here. I don't know why, if you know that the living God is, is on the floor with you, and He's on this stage, and He's in this area, and we pretend like this is the tabernacle. And over here, you walk in the entrance of the tabernacle, and you're walking over this way, and right here is the offer, where the offerings are being made right here to atone for your sin. And God's in that room in the Holy of Holies. And the priest would go in there once a year, design, set up, whatever, and they would tie a rope to that priest because if the priest walked into here, and he went into the Holy of Holies, and God's presence was, and glory was so great, sometimes it would kill them. And sometimes the priest would walk in, and they would have sin in their life. And guess what? You're dead. You're just dead. And they'd have to have a rope to pull them out because nobody could go in there. So this is kind of what we're dealing with. And this is what those preacher kids have seen and been around. And yet they decide they're going to do their own deal. They decide they're going to take it on themselves to do what they want and do what is right in their own eyes. Listen very carefully. It's not what's right in your eyes, it's what's right in his eyes. And when you mess with that, you're going to pay. I'm just trying to help you. So his sons, I'm going to try to say Nadab and Abihu. And that's the only time I'm going to say it because I can't pronounce it. Because I'm from Marietta. Okay. Here's what happened. They had just set up the priest system to take care of all of this, that God was going to be actually dwelling with us on earth. And here's what happened too. See, what's different now, God, the house of God is here. We used to have the house of God in a, you know, in the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies, and he moved to the temple. Remember this in the New Testament? Now, the, now if you want to meet God, he was in the temple. This is called the house of God. And then you hold to all these people when you were kids, don't run in the house of God. Well, that was a really good thought back then because that's where he was. But now the house of God is you. See, everything's changed. There's a reason why we get to live. So Aaron was the first priest, and he had four sons. But two of these sons decided they want to do their own thing. They were going to make their own sacrifice, and they were going to do what was right in their own eyes. Proverbs 21, 2. All a man's way seems right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. You have to be careful when you're dealing with God. So here's what they did. They walk in to the tabernacle, and if you go online, you can see how it was set up all the way around. Holy of Holies on the other end, and they go to where the sacrifice is going to be made, and the altar is going to be made, and they bring incense, and they bring an offering, and they bring all this stuff, and they decided that they were not going to wait on God. They were not going to do what they were told. And they built their own, brought their own wood, and they tried to light an unauthorized fire. God was the only one that could bring fire. He was the only one that could consume the altar, the offering, and forgive sin. No one else. So here's what happened. 
They, put a, they took the censers, put fire in them, and added. This is Leviticus 10. You might want to write this down, 1 through 3. Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. Let me tell you why. You don't want to walk over these verses. You want to pay attention. Nadab and Abu, Abi, Abihu took their censers, put a fire in them, and added incense. And they offered an unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. Nobody could forgive sin or consume sin but God himself. They have seen this happen over and over. It's like an Indiana Jones movie. I know you're thinking that, that fire comes out of heaven and burns up that offering. That's kind of what was going on. Can you imagine that sight? If I had been watching that, I would, I would have never <laughs> went into this place. This is how arrogant they were, and they thought, I'll do what I want to do. So the fire came out. Watch this. So they began to light the fire. And as soon as they started that, fire came down and came out through the Holy of Holies and consumed them, and they went poof. Two puffs of smoke, and down they went. So the fire came out of the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses had said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke when he said, Among those who approach me, I will show myself holy in the sight of all people. I will be honored. And his daddy, Aaron, the daddy of these two kids, the Bible says that he remained silent. Why do you think he remained silent? Wouldn't you remain silent? My kids walk in and fire comes out from the Holy of Holies and go, Poof. I'm, not, I'm not saying nothing. This is what was going on. Ashes to ashes. They told his cousins to come get them and take them outside the city. He said, but I don't want you to touch their bodies. You got to just touch the cloth around them and carry them out. And then he told the dad, he said, and I don't want you to mourn. Okay. Okay. Well, he had two more sons. I bet you they didn't do anything like that again. You imagine that? <laughs> I bet the preacher's kids straightened up. So when you walk, in, you walk in to meet God, you walk in with respect, you honor, and you better make sure there's no sin in there. Because God doesn't deal with sin. He doesn't deal with disobedience. So why in the world can we still live when we disobey God, when they could not? It's called grace. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. You better be glad. I'm very glad. I would have been a puff of smoke. How about you? I understand that. But we cannot treat God like another person, as if what we do doesn't matter. We cannot treat Him that way. We've got to be careful. The two types of things that God hates, I want you to get this. The first thing He hates is sin. When you think you can do your own thing, He does not tolerate sin in any form or fashion. You have to realize that. He does not tolerate those who ignore the truth of His Word. I'm talking to you Christians. Okay, we got the center part. I got that. But when I'm talking about, when he's talking about ignoring the truth of his word, when he's told you to do some things and you, and you, and you still don't do them, he's not going to deal with you. You're not going to, listen, you're not going to have your prayers answered. It's not going to have, he's not going to hear you until you deal with the sin. You cannot live in, practice in, participate in sin and deal with God in any form or fashion. You're not going to have the life you want. It's going to degrade you. It's going to take you down. Sin will always act the same way with a sinner or a Christian. It does the same thing. It behaves the same way. It takes you down. It breaks communication with God. You're not going to get what you want. It's not going to happen. God's not going to deal with sin or disobedience. And you have to look at your life. Listen to me, Christian. Let me talk to you for a minute. Let's look at it. What has he told us to do that we're not doing? That's what you have to ask. Because we like to pick and choose. If we go to the big four, we read God's Word, do we pray, do we serve, do we give, or do we keep God's money and spend it on something else? Listen to me. Any form of disobedience is sin to God, and you're not going to get anywhere with Him. The only reason we live is because of Jesus Christ. That's why we live. That's why Easter is so important to us, that we can make mistakes and still live. And this is what He's telling us. He's not going to tolerate those things. It's no respect of a person. I, I need you to hear that. 
So the, what is the difference, real quick? Let me do this. The difference for a Christian and a lost person or a sinner, first of all, a sinner is rega- disregarding God's Word to begin with. What's the difference between us? Well, let's think about this. We have a conscience, we have a Holy Spirit, we have God's Word, and we have the power to resist. That's, that's what we have. And we have the power to be forgiven by Jesus Christ. I can sin this week. And I can say, God, forgive me. He is hearing my prayer. But I'm telling you this, when I go to him and I want to pray, and I want to ask for God for something or pray for something, you know what he's going to do? Get this out of it. Can't deal with you till this is out. He can't deal with sin or disobedience. Now listen to me. You cannot practice sin as a Christian. Some of you have practiced sin over and over. If God's Word says this is a sin and you continue to practice that, He's not going to be able to deal with you. You're going to say, well, God blesses me. God, listen, I, I, hey, I, maybe things lined up for you. Maybe you had a good day. But I'm telling you, if you practice sin, He can't deal with you. And the reason why He's dealing with us at all, listen to this, is because of Jesus Christ. It's the only reason we're dealing, He's dealing with us at all. So is being obedient to God because I'm going to be good? I don't want to be a good Christian? What is, it, what is the deal with this? L- let, me, let me try to help you real, real quick because I want you to pay attention to this. It's called the Hollywood effect, and I want you to get this. Why is, so, why is God so hung up, and I'll be done in just a minute, so hang with me. Why is God so hung up on this obedience thing? Why is he so hung up on it? Watch this. The Hollywood effect says that we become what we act out. We become what we act out. We have a subconscious level and a conscious that we deal with. There's two things that are going on. And we become what we act out. Now watch this. On the conscious level, let's say you're going to drive a car. Okay? Let's say you're going to drive a stick shift. Y'all remember trying to drive a stick shift rather than an automatic? Well, on the conscious level, you have to think for a moment. You get into this car, and you're not thinking where the radio is. Maybe not. Or maybe you are. But you're thinking, turn it on, clutch in, you got a brake, you got a gas, and you got four gears. And you have a reverse somewhere in there. So all of, all of a sudden, you're on the conscious level, you're thinking, turn car on, push in clutch, first gear, drive. You're doing all these things on a conscious level because you've never done them before. And pretty soon you do it enough that you walk in, hit the clutch, turn it on, pop the radio and the phone's on, and you're driving a stick shift without a thought. Because it has moved from the conscious level to the subconscious level. And now I'm not having to think about it, I'm just doing it. You see? So it's like this, if I, you know, right foot, left, if I didn't have a subconscious thought, I'd have to do like this, right foot, left foot, right foot, raise hand, wave, back down. That's because I'm having to think of it. When you first accept Jesus Christ and you're trying to be obedient to what He wants, you're going right foot, left foot, right foot. So He's asking, He said, you need to be obedient and practice my, way, my ways. Not a hearer of it, not a prayer of it, not a talk of it, but a doer of it. Because I've got to get my ways past the conscious level into the subconscious level, and it becomes who we are. It's not, I have to, I got to be a good guy today. Oh, I got to be good today. Got to be good today. Got to be good. I don't want to sin today. I don't want to sin today. I just say, I got to serve. I got to read. I got to pray. I got to get. That's how you, most of you walk in like it every week. The Bible says that you walk, it's like looking at yourself in the mirror, and then you walk away and you forget what you saw. Like, what was that? It's like every time you walk in here, oh, oh, well, that's me. Like you don't even know what you look like. And some of you have never got God's word and God's obedience past this. That's why he wants you to be obedient. You can never become like Jesus Christ until you practice his ways. This is, this is beyond being good. This is becoming. And so I don't have to think about giving my life away. I just get up and do that. Turn the key on. Here we go. I don't have to think about tithing. I just do that. I, you know, when you get to that subconscious level, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, how could I not? How could I not pray for people? How could I not love my neighbor? How could I possibly think about myself before I think about somebody else? How could I possibly do that? That's because I've been obedient to His Word and I'm becoming 
more like Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking more like Jesus Christ. And I don't have to worry about it. Now I've just turned a key. Here we go. You see, that's where he wants. Some of you, but let me tell you what takes those away. Sin and disobedience takes that away. Some of you have not thought, it's not in your subconscious that you're supposed to do something for the cause of Christ. You still think I'm just supposed to be good. And you thought just coming to church is all you had to do. You're never going to know the blessings of God that way. If you're not going to, listen, we got to take the whole thing. If God asks us to do something, that's what we need to do. Is that, is that not the truth? Some of you have got to move past the conscious and move it into your subconscious. It should be an automatic thing to love people. It should be an automatic thing to pray for people. It should be an automatic thing to serve, automatic to give. You should never go to work or go anywhere not thinking, how am I going to do this and how am I going to help somebody? You should never, it's an automatic, it should be automatic. That's why he wants you to be obedient. The death thing's over. That's on Jesus. You don't have to die. That's on Jesus. The sin thing is on him. The truth thing's on you, though. I get to choose if I follow his word and his, his, what he tells me to do. I choose that. I choose if I participate in sin. I choose. That's on you. We're going to be obedient to him. We're going to become like Jesus Christ. We're going to do what he asks us to do. It's not a thought of it, not a prayer of it, not a talk of it. It's the doing. Now write this down. i got a refrigerator verse for you. You ready for this? Don't put this in your car. You'll have a wreck. James 1, 22 through 24. We're going to move from the conscious thought to the subconscious. Here's what he says. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. You are great hearers. <laughs> Most of you hearing what I did. If you heard what I said, raise your hand. Most of you are good hearers. Okay, some of you. Okay. I had a couple sleep this morning in the first service. I messed them up, though. I brought fire from heaven. It was unbelievable. Nah. But it messed them up this morning. I said, you're great sleepers and hearers. That's what they are. You're just deceiving yourself if you're not doing what you hear. You know what, you know what I'm saying? For anyone who's a hearer of the word, it's not a, it's not a doer. You know, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. That's what it says. For when he deserves himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. It's like every time you look in the mirror, it's like, it's, who's that? You see, see yourself in the mirror and you think it's somebody else because you forget what was going on. That's what happens when you hear it and you don't do it. What you got to think about is what I need to be doing. That's what we talk about all the time in here, all the time. We talk about the big four, read, pray, serve, and give. Listen, you don't have to like it. You don't have to feel it. You just do it. Some mornings I get up, I don't feel like a Christian. How about you? Going to work on Monday morning? Listen, nobody's going to get saved on the way to work, are they? You're about ready to hurt somebody. I mean, I understand that. You just do it. You don't feel it. You just do it. And you become it. And then one day it's an automatic, conscious, not a conscious, but a subconscious level where you just are, you just who you are. And you become Jesus Christ. That's what he's looking for. That's what he, that's what he wants. Obedience transforms us in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Nothing else. Quit waiting around on God to do something for you. You need to get with it. If you know that you're disobedient with God, get that right. If you've got sin in your life, listen to me. Here you go. I'm going to help you real quick. If you have sin in your life, you ready? Listen very good. Words of wisdom. Stop it. How about that? Don't do it again. Sounds easy, doesn't it? We have the power to overcome anything because of Jesus Christ. We're not going to die when we disobey, but we're not going to be blessed either. We have to change our thoughts and become who we are. All right, I'm done. All right, stand with me. Are y'all picking up what I'm laying down? I just want to know. Well, I hope so. Next week is Black Widow. You want to bring all your wives to that one. Okay. And wait a minute, bring your husband. Husband, you need to hear the husbands, you know, need to pay attention. All right. Jamie's going to be down front. There he comes. Come. Take your time, Jamie. Be all right. Come on up. All right. 
Jamie down here to pray with you. Some of you need to, we just need to, you need to figure out what's going on when it comes to disobedience. You need to figure that out and get it right. When it comes to sin, you need to get it right. You need to stop it. Okay, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. I pray your Holy Spirit would be with us as we walk through this together. I pray that everything we do will glorify you. Help us to be obedient. Show us where we're not. If there's sin in there we're not paying attention to, show us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.